think a lot of times when we talk about creativity outside of work, it seems maybe appealing or, but if you don't have sort of an art background, it could be scary. If we talk about it at work, it's sometimes it's appealing to people who are in design or maybe marketing, but not appealing to others. But I, I really like the, you know, when you just define creativity as like making stuff, um, that's what we have to do at, when we're running a business, when we're, if you're, you know, trying to um, write a blog post or you're trying to put together a presentation or you're trying, or you're trying to paint something like all of those things are about making stuff and they all are vulnerable to blocks, you know, to just feeling like I can't start. I'm not sure how to start. Usually when I can't start doing something, if it's an individual project, it's because I'm nervous about the outcome. Like I'm afraid I'm not gonna, what I make is not gonna live up to what I want it to be, or people are gonna criticize what I make, or they're not gonna care about it. You know, all those things would suck. And, and um, or I, maybe I don't know how to start because it's complex and I'm not sure, you know, I'm just don't, I, I can't quite think of the first step. And there are always all these other things to do besides making stuff, you know, answering emails and, um, first step is, and there are a million different things I might be doing otherwise that that could can distract me. And in the office setting, when we're trying to do something as a team, it's it's the same thing. Creativity yeah. can get blocked by just these these complexities and these fears of failure. And so I find it a really fascinating topic because it's something I struggle with all the time. And the design sprint is really kind of about both trying to help teams uh, to, to get out of the block of creativity, but also to try to help myself as a designer. In the very beginning, one of the key things I was thinking about were what are the steps I know I need to do when I start doing product design and how can I create a forcing function so I actually yeah. do them? You yeah. Know? I see creativity as a process. You know, it's not a skill. It's not like you're an artist and you can uh, create things uh, like you're, you're not a genius, basically. It's a process. It's a team process. And basically the sprint is just a probably the best process at uh, making people creative. Even, you know, like the most hardcore engineer or developer, you know, you take him on a sprint and yeah, on day uh, two, he's going to be able to sketch. On day three, he's going to be able to to show his ideas and that are good ideas, actually. That's that's the great thing about running sprints, yeah. Hmm. Cool. All right, that, I appreciate that. Okay, so uh, one of the first questions that we had gotten in earlier was from uh, Jerome, Jerome Fromal. Uh, he is from the Netherlands. He's actually somebody that's working on something called the talent sprint. Um, something that basically takes the design sprint process and kind of combines it with the hiring process and looking for uh, talent and, and basically showing how somebody can basically uh, prove through doing what they can do so that it kind of either bolsters or negates the need for a cover letter and a resume. But his question was uh, to both of you, um, what's your core motivator for doing the work you do and uh, the, effort, the efforts you make in your professional life? Well, first, just as a side note, that's such a cool idea to get people working together as a prototype, as a way to, for one thing, also just like, just like in a sprint, you're trying to test this thing that you're going to be committed to for a long time if you decide to do it. And that's certainly true with a job, you know, on both sides. So what an awesome idea for an application of it. Um, God, I, sorry, I got into that. And would you remind me, Robert, the question? Oh, core motivator, core yeah. motivator. Yes. Um, you know, just money. Just trying to make money. <laughs> <laughs> well, as long as you got that out of the way, then the yeah, cat's out of the bag. Just, the rest yeah, of just... um, I think, no, I was thinking about this before because um, you shared the questions before and I mean, you know, money does help sort of help us figure out sometimes what what's working and not. But I, I think kind of at the essence of it, it is a selfish goal, but it's not uh, it's it's not specifically money. Yeah. It's for me, I think the selfish goal is helping people. And I mean, it's selfish. I really mean it's selfish because helping other people, I think this is true for everybody, but maybe I'm particularly wired this way. It actually selfishly makes me feel good. Like if I feel like I help someone else, it makes me feel better about myself just to be like totally transparent and honest. So if, um, what has, what I'd like to do is to, you know, tr like try to find something that is fun for me to do in the moment and 
And I feel like it helps other people because if it helps other people, the joy lingers in a different way. There's a lot of things that are fun in the moment, but the joy doesn't linger. And I might later feel kind of icky about, you know, like I spent two hours playing video games and then later I might feel like, you know, I should have been hanging out with my family or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But with, with, if it, if it was helping other people, then the, the, the happiness lingers in a different way. And I think that for me, the theme, something that I'm just interested in has, is about, making good use of time. And that's, yeah. you know, if I can help people do that, I'm interested in it. And, um, and it strikes this sort of selfish, like reward center in my brain. Yeah. I have two very selfish reasons to, to, do, <laughs> to do sprint myself. One is about having an impact as a designer. I've been working in agencies for like uh, 12 years prior to run design sprints. And, you know, I was at the end of the, the food chain. Basically, I was just designing the vision of someone else. And, you know, the sprint, you can basically be at the beginning of the project yeah. of the loop and you can, yeah, you just have a, a better impact. Also, I'm quite, I would say, uh, conscious about environments, all these uh, climate change issues. And they are, these are really big problems. And I think the sprint is just a perfect framework to talk about that, to align people, uh, to tackle these huge uh, challenges. So I hope I'm going to have an impact on these two. And yeah, the last reason, it's very selfish, but it's just working with, with my wife, actually. Uh, yeah. This allowed me to create an agency to work with her. Uh, yeah, and it just makes me feel, feel good. Like as a person, you know, uh, running an agency but doing it with my wife and with, yeah. with my friends that's yeah. cool what about you robert yeah, what, what's, that's a good what's your motivator so my motivator is basically to elevate the practitioner uh, whether they come from a design a development uh, an advisory or research background and elevate them yeah. uh, a lot of my professional career has been about struggle and not having proper representation or mentorship at different points in my my career and I found that through organizing events like the GBDS and when I was at radio and some other places, that my best moments where I could take someone that had no ability on their own to find the right people to guide them or to teach them what they need to know or even give them the opportunity to fail and see and learn from it. Uh, I wanna be able to do that in my capacity now as a professional to take people like Sandy Lamb or Natalie Van Heron or even Rakesh who's very well, he's, he's very well established and what he does, but taking people that that are starting in this in this discipline or show some real promise, like uh, Haley Temple's another, um, just folks that I that I get a sample from, see what they're all about, look at their background, and you get that gut feeling about somebody. What motivates me is being able to showcase them, put them on a, on a pedestal, so to speak, and say, look, let's give you an opportunity to 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 take this moment in time to really see what you can do. And part of the whole GBDS presents thing is basically that. It's not only bringing in some incredibly talented and wonderful people like both of you, but it's to take people that maybe you may haven't heard of before or may not have known about and to give them a platform to give their point of view, show what they're doing and really uh, contribute in that way. And that's what's meaningful for me in terms of kind of doing all of this. I, I think it's really great actually. It's, uh, it's hard to exist as a designer, as an agency, you know, uh, it's, it's pretty easy to come out of Google and to be famous or to be seen. It's way harder when you start your own, your own thing, your own agency somewhere in the world. Uh, you know, I'm from Europe. It feels a bit far from Silicon Valley. And yeah, it's super important what, what you guys do to, to make the sprint famous and make it visible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so next up is Marie Glandis. And uh, I, we were talking offline about how she's uh, very influential in, in France and what she does with UX. Um, she sent in a couple of questions, but one in particular was about uh, the main challenges, Jake, uh, or the main changes that you would add to the original formula if you had to revise the book, the sprint book. Yeah. So you can do my video. Three days. <laughs> yeah, yeah just, um, just, just five hours. No, I think uh, the, there are a few things that I would change to the formula. And then there's some <laughs> things I'd like to I'd like to add to the book uh, if, you know, and hopefully there eventually will be a second a second version of Ooh, the book, um, but neat. not for not anytime soon, just to be clear. Um, I think that the one of the keys is to always try to find ways to make the product, the, the process more effective. And so one of the things that um, has been cool about having it out in the world is that people have, um, I think, I think one of the things that I'm good at is seeing things kind of from with fresh eyes, like looking at the processes from fresh eyes and I get frustrated really easily and impatient. And that in the context of design sprints has been good because usually I notice the, 
a lot of the things that were slowing down and, and, you know, wanted to make them work better. But it turns out there are some things that I didn't notice or that I got used to the pain of in a design sprint and other people having seen it with the same perspective of trying to improve things have found improvements. Uh, Steph is one of those. So the Noten map is a great technique for Monday, uh, making the map. And I teach that in workshops now. I think it's excellent. There are a few more modifications to the map making on Monday mm -hmm. that I've um, that I've started to learn myself just through doing workshops and seeing, getting to see lots of teams do these steps at the same time. Um, there is uh, this idea of the um, storyboarding 2.0 that AJ and Smart does. So just again, like the note and map using using this kind of note and vote style activity to get everybody to write down how they think the storyboard should work. The map and the storyboard are the two like most challenging and painful parts to facilitate. Mm -hmm. And I got accustomed to the, the pain mm -hmm. of those things. And then also is in this part where I'm really comfortable, like being at a whiteboard is one of the parts where I'm the most comfortable in the sprint. Um, you know, there are other parts where I might feel less confident, but that part I feel really good about. And so I, I really forgot like what, how awful it was for the rest of the team. They're not at the whiteboard. They're sitting there like watching me, you know, go through the storyboard or whatever. And it sucks. Um, so those are, there are tangible tactics that mostly come from people outside trying this and, uh, like Steph and then posting about it. And, um, and some of it comes from things that I've had the chance to practice by teaching it more. And sometimes by teaching, you know, you learn more than just by doing so. Um, so yeah, there's some, there's a few tactical things. Then if I was to write another version of the book, I'd love to tell some of the stories of things that have happened afterward. And, you know, um, some of the stories that are in the book have kind of a, there's, there's more of a, you can look back and see what happened to those projects or those companies on a longer uh, scale, which is interesting. Um, like Slack went public this year and that's really cool because there's a story about Slack in the book and um, some of the other companies have been, um, you know, acquired. Uh, they've had good, they've had, you know, pretty much across the board, really good outcomes, which is kind of crazy because startups so often fail that one of the things I was really scared of was that all, all those stories would turn out to be disastrous in hindsight, but they've been really pretty good. Um, but the other thing is that the stories of what people have done with design sprints on their own are so cool. And so the, the global virtual design sprint is a great example yeah. of that. And, um, you know, what, what Lego's done with doing design sprints at a large scale is, is really interesting. And they did that on their own. You know, there are all these things that, that unfortunately don't have anything to do with me personally, but are really cool stories. And I think show people what you can do with it and yeah. give people like a, a jumping off place. Yeah. So yeah, so that's, I think I would love to see a, a next version of the book, hopefully like give people even more inspiration about what can yeah. you do with a, with a recipe. Yeah, you, I, I don't think you can separate yourself too much from what's going on around the book because the book at, at, its, at its foundation acts as sort of a blueprint for everything that's been going on. And really it's a testament to this core idea of efficiency and maximizing everyone's time for an endeavor that's supposed to be of consequence, of, of, of significance. Uh, just the, the sheer fact that somebody can take the, the, the concept of that five days and it's been you know, rearranged, like uh, moved about, experimented with, and even to 2019, so almost three years after it was originally published, we're still kind of, uh, kind of fooling with the, the model in terms of how it could be done, both in terms of time and in technique and mixing it in. In, in, in a way, because you've been present with the entire movement around the discipline, I think you have contributed a lot. Uh, I think it's just, it's, it's a testament to the, to the, the, um, the foundational pieces of what you were presented in the book. And I, and I, I always encourage people to take, to at least read it or scan it because it's, it's one of those things that people, when people get it, I read it, really they get it. <laughs> yeah. No, but yeah, yeah uh, thank you, Robert. Uh, thank you. I would like to add a, to add a side note. Um, okay, the book was published in 2016. We are 19, and we are in an industry where everything needs to be fresh and new, and everything. And there is a tendency that you know you read online, better process. It's faster. It's better. It's smarter. Uh, I would like to say that 
we started with shorter sprints or with our own variations because we thought we were smarter, basically, at first. And then I went back to the book. All the time, I was, you know, messing up something during a workshop. It wasn't going the way I wanted. I was reading in the book. I was like, oh, yeah, that's actually better than what we are doing. And I, I went back to the book and thought, I, I, yeah, I think that this, the book is totally fully relevant. Maybe there are a couple of things to tweak, like, yeah, in the mapping, things like that. But globally, I mean, read what is in the book. It works. And... For your first sprints, maybe it's a good idea to start with the book, uh, run what is in the book, and then if you feel comfortable, yeah, then you can change and adapt. But that right. would be my advice as, a, as an agency. Yeah. It's like cooking. You have to start with yeah. the basics. You have to know the basics in terms of how you do it. And then once you get, you get more confident, you understand the ingredients better, you start experimenting a bit here and there and, and kind of know, you know, I like pastries better. Or, you know what, I really like working with slow cooker. You'll start to find where your sort of niche is within the process or at least what you really kind of focus on, whether it's research or the strategy or the business side of it. But that's the whole, that's the whole point is that it allows you to personalize it in a way so that you can take what's there as the blueprint and kind of move it forward. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, by the way, Marie was in live chat. The, we just answered a question. She asked another quick one. She says, how do you deal with people who say, I don't like drawing really when you're about to do a crazy eight? Yeah. It's, my, my approach to that has been, um, to say like, to really emphasize what happens in the four step sketch. Uh, so it's, it definitely is more comfortable for a person who's comfortable drawing. There's no doubt about that. But um, I, I wanna tell people in a sprint a couple things. First, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, you'll have a point. Okay, he's drawing on yeah, something. Right? Uh, <laughs> so, the, so the first part is like, I wanna acknowledge their pain. Like, you know, okay. I, this is going to feel uncomfortable. And I think it's, I think that when you say this feels uncomfortable, you have already come a long way towards bridging the gap between somebody's concerns and, uh, and getting them to do it. You know, it's, it's a much different feeling when you feel like you're sort of up against everybody in the room or you having a private, you know, like internal fear and having the person who's leading the process come to you and say like, look, this is maybe uncomfortable. And so if I get any, I try to remember to say that every time, but especially if I have any kind of a vibe that somebody's uncomfortable, and especially, especially if they've said it, you know, I want to say, yeah, you're right. Like acknowledge that, like it's uncomfortable. Um, the way that this is set up, this is me like talking, imagining talking in the sprint, the way this is set up, the four step sketch, it's meant so that you have a lot of things that'll happen before you get to sketching anything you have to share. So the, the notes we're going to take, the ideas you're going to jot down on your own and the crazy eights, those are totally private. They're just for you. Nobody is going to look at those. We're not going to talk about them. It's just your work. And by the time we get to that last step, you're then going to have a lot of material to work with to make that sketch. So it's not going to happen all at once. And I also will tell people, I've been in a lot of sprints and seen people do this process, you know, hundreds of times, um, hundreds of people doing it. So what's interesting about that is to see that when you go through the whole sprint, it is like more often than not the case that one of the sketches that's the best is not the prettiest. It's one, that, you know, it's a sketch that yeah. it, it may not come from a person who was comfortable drawing it, but they are, you're going to have all the time you need to put your ideas on paper. And we really just need words and boxes. You know, if you just make the words clear and draw boxes, you're going to be able to represent pretty much everything, yeah. maybe a stick figure or two, but there's no need for illustration. I actually uh, learned the trick at the Google conference. Uh, I think Amr was uh, mentioning that. So it's mm. a Felix Wong from Google who was showing that trick. It's basically, you know, you just ask at the beginning of the sketching process, people to take a piece of paper and just draw some random loops like that. Okay. And then you ask them, now I give you two minutes and out of these loops, you make as many birds as you can. So it's pretty easy. You just, you just draw some beaks like that, draw some eyes and you just add some little legs. That's actually, that's actually a cute bird in here. And mm -hmm. you draw as many as you can. And it that's just cool proves that it doesn't need to be more pretty anyone can recognize that it's a bird. It's pretty cool, like just to kickstart the sketching process, it's like, okay, now, like how many birds do you have? Okay, I have 10, I have 12, whatever, and then you can start. 
And it's just about getting started, right? So that's the way they do it at Google right now. Pretty cool, right? Can I keep that? I'm going to put that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I can <laughs> sign it. Make sure you sign it. Get it signed. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just going to be a random sketch. You have to have him. <laughs> there you go. That's I mean, perfect. I would say that you, you could, if I were to do something like this, just because I, I have a, I have a little bit of a, a nervous reaction. It works. It works. Okay. Okay. I, I believe it. I believe. It. But, but I would be less. I'd be more comfortable doing this in a room full of, you know, designers or Googlers than I would if I'm uh, working with a bunch of strangers in a company. I'm, you know, I'm, I've come in as a consultant, and maybe they're all engineers or, um, you know, business people and sort of businessy outfits. I would feel less comfortable having them draw loops and draw birds. So if somebody was listening and they felt that way, I would say. <laughs> a more like just you know straight down the middle basic thing you could do as a warm up activity is to have people draw like boxes and stick figures and like that's because those are the elements that you yeah. actually use in a sprint whereas you unlikely to you know to use birds yeah. but anyway the, i think the point i totally get the point right like it's like you everybody can do this stuff yeah jake actually has a uh, he has a great trick i stole that joke from uh, his slide deck actually it's like you know, you are telling, oh, uh, so now, 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 now it's time to draw, and you show a crazy sketch for Michelangelo or something <laughs> crazy. So everyone's like, <gasps> and then you say, no, no, and th then you show some actual social sketch that look horrible, and you know, it breaks attention. That's fun. Yeah. Like it works all the time. Yeah, if you are doing sprints on a regular basis, and you can find a snap a photo of yeah. one that wins, that's like not pretty. Yeah. I think that's really helpful to show yeah. people. Yeah. Like. Um, and there's one, I think there's one actually in the sprint book that's not especially beautiful. That was like the winning sketch in the blue bottle coffee sprint. And it's a, you know, it's, I think it's helpful for people to see. It has like words and then they're like scratched out and they drew it again. But sorry, that was, I'm rambling now. Anyway, we should go on to the next question. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's one in, uh, question in particular for you, Jake. Uh, okay. And this comes from me. It's uh, when you were writing code as a kid, uh, when you were doing coding, how did that influence your thinking around design sprints? Yeah, yeah, you and I were talking about this and I have been thinking about this topic again because my my older son has not been interested in coding at all, but my younger son actually has started to use Scratch, which is, if you're a parent, it's really cool. It's like this way you could, yeah. It's, yeah, uh, mine does it too. He's uh, he's, very, he's very happy whenever he has, has a colored maze and he can move something through it. <laughs> Keep going. Yeah, so so um, Scratch is a way that, you know, kids can write code and it's very accessible to them. And I was really lucky when I was a kid, we had a, a Macintosh computer and in the, in the era that that was, this is like the late 80s, early 90s, um, there was this program called HyperCard. And it, you could write, you could write code. You could make UIs for things before the web. But you could, you could like put buttons, and it's basically website-like things where mm -hmm. you go from like screen to like page to page. They were called cards, and then you um, you'd write little scripts. And I made games using this thing, and I I was thinking about it a lot because of my son using Scratch now. And um, there's there are a couple things that I think are really valuable about, are uh, really informative for me in doing design sprints from that experience. The first one is just making something on your own gives you a, a feel for what it's like to build a product that it is harder to get. It took me longer to like get the feel for how a team or a company builds a product because it's just, it just gets a lot bigger when you're doing big things and there are, you know, five people or 10 people or a hundred people or more who are working together on this larger thing. It's hard to wrap your head around it. But for me, it was always helpful to anchor back on that experience of making a game you know, from beginning to end I'm, I'm by myself, you know, giving to my friends, watching to see if they could play it, watching to see if they wanted to play it, you know, that was, that really like helped me think about the process of coming up with stuff and testing it. And I didn't mean to, but um, it was really helpful. The other part about it that I think is kind of interesting just to think about if you're running sprints is uh, I've heard this called procedural thinking. When you write code, something that you learn is procedural thinking, which is basically like first this, then this, then this, then this. And if this, then this, you know, all, all of that stuff, it's like you, the code is this, is this plan for what's supposed to happen. And you, you have this idea in your mind of what you want to have happen on screen. So you try to write the code and then, you know, invariably it doesn't work. Then you have to figure out where did it not work? And then you, you fix it. And that's really what the design sprint was, uh, applying this idea of procedural thinking to, to the work week and to how a team would work together. And so the checklist, it's really, it's the code, 
And the process of developing that checklist was very much like debugging code. You know, I have in mind what I want the team to do during this week. And then when it doesn't work, I can look at the code. It, usually at work when something doesn't work well, we can't like so easily look at the code. But if you have a checklist, if you've kept track of the steps, then you can see where it went wrong and you can experiment. And mm -hmm. so anyway, I, I don't know if that's just, um, me having fun talking about myself but if you if you think maybe that's useful you can i don't know apply that idea to anything really like the, the procedural mm -hmm. debugging thing. I, I would emphasize this on, on that I, I mean i have been coding too as a teenager and young adults uh, i was doing front end actually and this helps me a lot to to earn kind of the, the respect of the engineers and developers who are part of the sprints, for example, you know, they are, they would always question the process. They, they are just so afraid that, you know, it's just a shallow design thing, you know, yeah. with uh, everything flying around being in 3D and that it's more grounded. And uh, yeah, that's, I have that, you know, coding experience. They know that it's on the good tracks. And if we do an exercise, it's for a good reason. And yeah, it's just better, you know, better exchanges basically and better, yeah, j j just a mutual trust. And you, you don't need to be good at coding coding at all, but you need to understand at least how it works and what is the job. Yeah, it is nice yeah. to have that at a high level. And I would say like, I know nothing about coding now. I'm not like up on things and haven't been for a really long time. And I kind of question the conventional wisdom that designers should know how to code because yeah. it's hard to become an expert in everything. You just can't. But a little bit uh, goes a long way. And in fact, even if all you did was just talk about that idea of debugging, like basically what this process is, is it's like a debugged version of the code for a team working together. That little statement right there, this is a debugged version of a process of a code for a team working together. That could get you a lot of credibility with, because they're like, oh, okay, I get, I get what you're talking about. Yeah, you don't have to be necessarily deep in coding. I always, I always preach self-awareness and just basically being uh, comfortable with and a little, maybe a little uncomfortable in certain areas, but to get a, a perspective and awareness of how your craft affects others and being able to yeah. translate what you do into that craft or even understanding from a coding perspective. Because I started coding when I was five. They put me in front of a PEC computer. You know, those ones that used to have the tape tracks where you used to put them in, press play, yeah. and that's how you loaded all the data into the computer. That was where I started. And I broke that thing 13 times. I, <laughs> I put in poke commands, not knowing what I was doing. And I was actually changing the firmware on the, the, the motherboard. And uh, they didn't let me there a computer for over a year. And then I the bought it back when they had an updated version of the OS on there and everything was fine. <laughs> that's yeah, that's a little bit of my history with coding. I, I, I go way back. I'm like, oh, serious. <laughs> working in basic. Um, so we have a question from Thibet Mabruk. He is an Agile master at uh, ISTA International over in Eisen, Germany. And his question was, uh, how, how to make a digital agency offering for design sprint facilitation and trainings to get clients? Yeah, well, I don't know. Good luck. But you guys, you guys <laughs> have more experience than I do selling sprints. Uh, where people have to pay money. And so, the, I mean, the reason I don't know, uh, just to buy you a bit of time to think, is yeah. that, um, Thank you. It, but it's important to keep in mind because when I talk, I'm talking about mostly experience that I had in the early days of design sprints. It was at Google. I was in a Google employee working with Google Teams. So to the teams, it was free. They weren't paying me. I was mm -hmm. already getting paid. And when I worked at Google Ventures and was doing it with startups, there are a couple of weird things there. One is that we were the investor in the company. So not only did they not have to pay me, it was almost like we were paying them. I mean, we were like, we're giving you money and then we, we want to make this sort of additional investment of time in you. Um, but, um, but also that startups, the start, it's like very hard to work with startups and make money off of it because they don't have a lot of budget and, you know, it's just, it's, it's tough. Um, mm. they're, but in some so in some ways they're like impossible to work with in this context where they didn't have to pay for it. They can be really unusually good to work with for design sprints because when they're small, they tend to be pretty focused about what's the most important thing. And so the idea of like, what's the value proposition of this? It's like, I'll help you do the most important thing fast. They get that. I think it's more natural to get that than it might be at a big complex organization. Yeah. So that's the problem with listening to me. Yeah. 
most of our clients are corporates. They're not startups. Even if in the book it's it's about startups, um, we don't have this kind of clients in Europe for some reasons. Yeah, they don't have money. They think they know better. That's why they even start a startup, you know, in the oh, first yeah, place. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, they, they don't know what what they need. You basically in corporates, they have just bigger bigger challenges. You know that we require this kind of uh, of experience. But I started four years ago. Uh, we've been really lucky to be the first ones, I guess, to do it commercially in, in Europe at least. And um, when I started, um, one of my very first prints, I got a deal. Like I did it for free, but we could actually film the whole, uh, record the whole process. So we had a GoPro camera uh, on the ceiling. Uh, we took a lot of photos and. When you go on my website, design-print.com, uh, design uh, you see a video when you enter the website and some of these images, they are images from my very first print. Oh, wow. And I, I think documenting the process of one of my very first prints helped me a lot to get some clients because they could see exactly what it was. Uh, they could see, you know, it's very powerful to show the, the early sketches and then the prototype and then what it became. And, yeah. you know, the, so really emphasize the, pro, the, um, the prototype. So I think that's very important. And yeah, you have to come uh, with case studies. Even if it's hard to show case studies because you have to sign NDAs and stuff, you need to ask your clients, can I show them privately to my future clients? And this is always a seller. So never come empty handed. Just don't say, oh, um, yeah, it's in the book. So we're going to do exactly that. No, you have to come with something concrete. And if you can sell it at first, that's fine. Just do it for free. As soon as you have enough of case studies, then you're going to be able to address, uh, to, yeah, to get the clients. When I spoke to, sorry, go ahead. No, yeah. When I spoke to Bill Alexi yesterday, we had this question come up too um, in a different variation. And Bill's answer was was pretty interesting, and I'm I'm kind of on board with it too. Is that it has to start with it has to start with human relationships, yes. and especially and I, and in fact, I wrote an article about this about how to sell design sprints where. I, it's not really about the process. It's about understanding the pain that the other person is going through, the other organization is, and if you're the right person to kind of tackle that. Everything else is kind of an execution play or understanding what you bring to the table, but people want to understand what you're all about and what you, how you interact and how you conduct yourself professionally. If you lead with yourself, then the services you provide and how you kind of set up for different situations will depend on context, but it's, it's almost secondary. You really need to be the person that, that comes to the table and say, okay, I have this, I, we have this history. You can see what we've done as a company, but now it's, let's talk about your situation. If you, can, if you can have that kind of empathy right up front and kind of talk with the, the person about what they're experiencing and try to be able to understand and walk them out in their shoes, you'll be one step ahead of the game with a lot of people that just kind of put the design sprint out there as like the, the, the silver bullet to kind of fix all problems. One of the things that you said, Robert, I think in that post is, um, Nobody cares about design sprints. <laughs> and you know what? That is true. That is the truth. Yeah. And it can be, it, it certainly could be challenging for me to remember that. Like um, this thing that I'm thinking about all the time, like they don't care. <laughs> and like all of the benefits yeah. and cool things that will happen, they don't care. They, they have a problem they're trying to solve. And yeah. this, I, what you're describing is like actually trying to figure out what, if I was in their shoes, what do I need? What, what do they need? And then like, how can I help them do that thing? Um, this, when you, as you're saying that, I was thinking back to when I worked at Google Ventures and I would talk to a startup founder and, you know, we just did like office hours. So we had times when we were doing design sprints and then we had weeks when we weren't doing sprints. And one of the activities would be like office hours days. And it might meet with like, you know, five or six or eight, if it was really busy, different, um, you know, founders or people from startups. And in those meetings, the script would basically be like, um, yeah. So just tell me like, what's keeping you up at night? That's like the starting question. And if the meeting was a half an hour or an hour, whatever, like, like 80% of that time is just like asking questions about what's going on with them. Like, yeah. what are the challenges? What's the big thing they're trying to do? What are they stressed out about? What are the challenges? And then at the end, it's like, here's some ways I might be able to help. And maybe it's a design sprint, you know, maybe it's not, but if it, if it wasn't design sprint, it was really yeah. about how does it help with the thing you need? Um, and, and, you know, that means picking the one little piece of the design sprint that helps most of the time. That was the prototype, just to your mm -hmm. point, like we can make a prototype fast. So to give you an example, you know, like, I think a way we could help as a design sprint, it would get you a prototype of that thing you're stressed out about starting in like one week. Um, and sometimes it might be, you're going to get some data, but usually that was yeah. the hook. Um, also it's about you know, truly trying to help the clients. You're not coming to sell something, you're yeah, trying to help yeah. them. And sometimes 
you know, it's like the way to go is not doing a sprint. Yeah. Uh, so mm -hmm. sometimes I would recommend like, uh, yeah, you just go to, to these guys. They will help you better. Maybe it's doing business model canvas. Maybe it's doing problem framing. Maybe it's doing just a prototype. And yeah, you, you might not need a sprint. That's fine. So and that, and that, has, that has benefits as well. I mean, that's something that, that people don't sometimes don't um, take into account is that they appreciate the fact that you're not going to take them for a ride or try to just sell them something in the short term. You're really concerned about whether or not that you're the right person for the job and that if there's someone in your network that can help them better, that's just karma. I mean, that just basically is goodwill kind of gesturing out. If, if you... If that's something you do lead with and other people recognize that, then it's probably going to come back to you two or threefold. Yeah, we, we also have, you know, that um, misunderstanding. Since our name is Design Sprint LTD, we get some requirements. Like, like, like people coming, uh, they would like a sprint in New York. And they ask me, I'm not the best person to run a sprint in New York. So I would recommend someone in New York or on the East Coast to run the sprint. Yeah, and I, yeah it's, it's just about being a, yeah, be, being a, good, uh, a good colleague, a good person. Speaking of running sprints in different places, there is a question that came up from Bernardo June. He is the managing director at Spark 44 over at the United Arab Emirates. And so what I have spoken to and have met, he says, what, if any, are the differences that you have experienced doing sprints across different cultures? For example, would you plan or approach the sprint in a different way for a traditional Japanese company? Yeah, can you hear my, is that my, there's a dog barking. It might be my dog. Uh, sorry about that, everybody. It is almost certainly. I'm surprised there's nothing coming from downstairs where I have to kind of go, okay, I, let me move it to a different room. Because normally, yeah, yeah. Just, just, can't, can't I can answer. I can't answer about Japanese culture, but I can answer about at least French culture. Should I go? Yeah, yeah. go for it. In French, I know it's the same in a lot of languages. We have a polite form when you, when you address someone. It's like when you say you, there is the casual you that you use with your colleague, and there is the polite you uh, that you will tell to someone older than you or your boss or someone you respect. And this can really affect or break the dynamic of the sprint because half of the team, they will say tu, which is casual you, and half of the team will say vous, which means I respect you, you. And that's really something we, we, need, to, we need to break that dynamic to you know, have really a casual atmosphere. So one, one trick we use is to have badges, you know, uh, during the sprint. And I ask everyone to write uh, his or her first name on the badge. So I can call, if the decider is Phil, instead of saying you, I will say Phil. And it sounds more friendly until the moment he will, he will call me, you know, uh, by two, because I'm younger and whatever. And then I can go back to him saying two. And then the only fact that I'm an outside facilitator and that I'm using his first name, it works. And then it aligns the whole team on a casual way of, uh, of, uh, yeah, of conversation. And that helped me a lot. And I know it's the same in German. I know it's the same in a lot of languages. Uh, yeah, English speakers don't have that issue, but we, we do have that. So that's such a good example of how real the, the cultural thing can be and uh, how you can use a, a tactic to, to try to design the flow of the conversation to work in the way you need it to. And specifically for Japan, I don't know, but there's a really good post about it. In fact, I'm gonna, um, oh, do you know? No, no, I, I, was, I have a story to tell, but go, finish your thought. Well, well actually, tell the story, because I'm gonna, I'm gonna find the link and I'm just gonna put, uh, paste it into the chat, because there's a, somebody, um, this guy, um, Chris uh, Palmieri wrote, who runs an agency, in Tokyo and um, AQ, who's, uh, yeah. uh, they're um, uh, involved in the Sprint conference and stuff. Tomomi Sasaki. Um, and yeah, 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 yeah. And they have a post about how they how they do um, uh, Sprints in Japan, in Tokyo, and it's yeah. interesting. So I'll share it. Um, okay. I, have a, I heard a trick from Tomomi, maybe I can share. Uh, she told me that uh, in, in Japan, like when she's facilitating, uh, she's, you know, like she, since she's, kind of um, uh, small and she's a woman, you know, she's always wearing a red scarf, you know, that makes her look bigger and more, you know, like, uh, yeah, just bigger as a person. And it works better, you know, for facilitating. Uh, so she's, yeah, she's using that trick in Japan, this I know. So my story is from a podcast I did with Felipe Pontes. He is a service designer, uh, design sprinter that's been working out in Tokyo and has been there for a while. He originally had his start with news, <clears throat> but then he was uh, adopted into the marketing side of things. And long story short, he told me that there is in Japan, 
uh, you really have to hit a certain level of trust with clients. Yeah. So that means going out with them physically and doing a lot of drinking. So a lot of <laughs> um, like, like literally they, you have to have multiple meetings with them. But he, if I recall correctly from the podcast, he said, once you have their trust, then you're in and then the, the work comes. But you have to cross that Rubicon of, of, of a certain level of familiarity and that you're not going to you know, dishonor them in any way. Uh, but it was really interesting to hear it. He says that he, he was going, I was like, yeah, there's been meetings where it's just been, man. <laughs> so that, that's my, that was my little funny story I, I remember from, uh, from Felipe. Interesting. Cool. Um, so uh, I lost my train of thought for a second. Oh, now I know. Um, so the next one is by uh, somebody that I'm a big fan of, we were talking about before. That's uh, Amir Arabson, who just recently yeah. went to Austin, Texas, was at the Google Design Sprint Conference. Steph, I think you've met him. In fact, I know you met him. Um, and he's just, he's just a great guy. Uh, and so his question is, at SprintCon, Kai from Google shared some insight about how they do design sprints at Google. And one thing that struck me was not only do sprinters share their crazy eight sketches, but they also <laughs> vote on them. I talked to Steph about this, and I'd also like him and Jake to discuss the pros and cons of doing this. And he says, thanks. <laughs> well, I, I just have to be honest. And, and I, I have to preface my honesty with saying that I think that Kai is excellent and super smart and, She's the best. and does things very well thought through. And I think that Google does. Uh, he radiates confidence. She's very much uh, knows what she's doing. Knows what she's doing. But but I really disagree with this, and I don't get it. Uh, and the um, the reason why I disagree with it, I mean, we were talking about the um, sketching thing earlier. I think it's it's so rare at work that you have the opportunity. Let's say you got five people in your sprint, or seven people, whatever. It's so rare that you're going to have the chance to see what seven people's unique opinionated version of how should we solve this problem is without discussion because discussion is the default at work that is going to happen there's no question that people will eventually get to you know build off of each other's ideas and um, and sort of like be inspired by others ideas and all those things but what's that's not special but what's special is seeing from every person not just the designer or just the product manager but every person on the team to have their opinionated version come out I think is really unique. And I think for folks who like me, there's, I listen to a really, um, I listen to Malcolm Gladwell's uh, podcast and, um, you know, Malcolm Gladwell, a lot of people will criticize him because he, sometimes the stuff he says is kind of obvious or sometimes it doesn't, you know, like the, the points he makes, but, um, and I would agree that that's true, but it's, it's always good storytelling. And sometimes he's, there's something that comes up and I'm like, oh yeah, that's a really interesting way of looking at it. And one of the things recently was this idea of like tortoise thinking versus hair thinking, like tortoise versus hair, like fast thinking, people who come up with things quickly and people who take a longer time to, to think of things. And I would put myself in the category of a slow hair, uh, sorry, tortoise. Uh, it takes me a long time to, to come up with a solution. And I know a lot of people are like that. So if you interrupt that flow, if you stop me before I've gone all the way through and made my solution, done all those steps, which are really designed to be done independently, and you make me share, you're going to put me out of the, the quiet, like building, you know, deep Cal Newport, like deep work mode that I'm in. And you're going to put me in this uh, conversational mode. And then now I have to make a bunch of judgments about mm. what other people are doing. And is that thing better than what I'm doing? And all of my insecurities about my own solution may come out now. And uh, I think what you're likely to see is more convergence rather than the, that opinionated thing. And I think it also, again, in my opinion, like is going gonna, is gonna to undercut the, the quality of what you'll get from the people who are the least comfortable with, with sketching. Mm. Now, this is, I think, I'm, I, I don't know how to devise a test where you sort of prove which way or the other is better. So I think fundamentally it just comes down to like opinions. And my opinion is no more valid than, than Kai's opinion or than, than Google's opinion, but that is my opinion. I think you should, it should be individual work. You go all the way through and then you, you look at the stuff at the end. Um, I think the other last thing I'd say is I think complicating this is that it feels good to do the voting process 
and to share and it's kind of fun to see what other people are doing. Mm -hmm. And I think that oftentimes the feelings of fun um, and, and what, what is, uh, what, what sort of makes for feeling like a more collaborative process gets in the way of what is the, the right process. Mm -hmm. There are parts in the design sprint that are actually pretty uncomfortable, like all of Monday is pretty much not that fun. But I found like really is the best way to, to do it. And so I, I um, uh, that's part of what makes me concerned about people like starting to do that elsewhere is I think they'll have fun doing it. I just don't think it'll get the best ending point. Okay. Yeah. It actually made me think this uh, this workshop exper experimenting it. Uh, I have to say that I was in a group with very smart people. I, I guess Google Google level of people, and it delivered. I mean, there were a lot of really great ideas. We had no time to sketch something, and they were really great ideas. And it made me think. Um, I see a lot of issues of doing that because you look, it's not, it's not anonymous anymore. Um, you, yeah, it becomes group thinking, it becomes a conversation. So I won't do it during my sprints. I understand why it works at Google, but watch out doing that because it's not gonna work in your companies uh, because people are just not all Googlers. Uh, but there is one use case I see that could be very interesting is to ask. So just before the sessions catch to ask uh, the people, are you comfortable? Do you have an idea that you want to sketch? And if you have two or three per persons saying, no, I don't know what to sketch, and you know, I'm lost, you just send everyone for a break and then you let these two or three per persons exchange, like show what they have, and maybe it's going to inspire them to go forward. That's the only use case I would see some value. Otherwise, I will watch out doing that. As a follow up, we should really have Kai in the call. Yeah. And we should talk to Kai about it because I, because Steph and I will definitely like pile on about like doing it our way. But so I, so I will schedule the rebuttal towards the yeah, end. Yeah. 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 Because yeah, yeah. yeah. it's not fair. It's not, it, we really should hear her because I guarantee she has like a really good response to this. Yeah. So I, I don't doubt that. And uh, I think the perspective on that you're both giving to this is, uh, I, I definitely relate to that, especially with people, those friends that I've done in the past. Um, someone made, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna totally kill this quote. Uh, it's like the the best fruit are from the trees that are hardly ever picked. So that uh, it, it's it's basically saying that sometimes the ideas that that are the most intriguing come from people that are hardly paid attention to, that have, that are deep thinkers, that that they can put things together, but are are maybe more introverted than most. Um, and sometimes if you have that kind of dynamic where you've assigned certain people the authority to do certain things within a sprint whether it's iterating or what have you, um, and, and kind of make that as the lead thing, then I think to Jake's point, you're right. You start to lose people and you kind of feel like there's politics within the room that needs to be considered. Um, really quick, gentlemen, we're at, we to have 10 minutes left. I just need to know if we're at a hard stop right at the half hour or we have opportunity to flex in case there's some questions that you wanna kind of uh, run with. We have the opportunity to flex. Uh, I mean, unless you have something, but... Um you can just leave i'll keep talking <laughs> but uh um <laughs> but we uh but i will try to answer more, yeah. more quickly we could try to do like sort of a yeah. lightning-esque right cool. yeah. yeah sure so um just 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 to make you aware of time i don't i want to be respectful of the fact that, that we had an hour especially because um, the time timer doesn't seem to have batteries in it <laughs> no, 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 it's not well, if we're going by the clock in the back of the room then i'm just gonna go <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's just get in. Everyone, yeah. We'll take a five minute bathroom break. We'll get some things, come back. It'll be like a mini sprint. So, <laughs> um, so Jake, the ne this, this next one's for you. Um, again, a previous conversation we had about the connection between what we do as kids and what we do now. Uh, from your perspective, and again, Steph, please chime in. How do you think your experiences in your childhood influence um, kind of the Professions, the actions you do, and and uh, what was your thinking around when we when we were discussing that earlier? Yeah, I mean, part of it's definitely some of the things I touched on with like making games and and um, and trying to build things, you know. And um, but part of it is, I guess, you know, I think that when we're when we make this shift from when I made the shift from being a kid to you know, whenever, whenever you like stop being a kid and you become something else, I guess maybe it's when you're a teenager, maybe it's when you go to college, maybe it's when you start work. Those are like maybe degrees of like steps away from being a kid, but it becomes like for, well, for me, I can only speak for myself. It, it became 
not the goal to have fun. And, and, you know, um, <laughs> and like that, like there were, it was, there were other goals and that's not just because of outside, uh, pressure from the workplace or whatever. It's an internal shift. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's an internal change in like, what do I expect from myself and, um, being more aware of like the, the, like, what am I projecting? What do I look like? You know, what do I look like to the other college students, the, you know, the girls I'm trying to impress? What do I look like to the, my new employee, my new colleagues at work? Um, and a lot of the, the, the things that start to affect what I do or what I want to do or how I, how I, like, what my sort of um, quality bar is for how I spend my time, um, it's, it gets all messed up. It's like looking at a kid, you know, so simple, like you're just, you're just trying to do stuff that's like interesting to you and fun. And like, it's so, it's so enjoyable to watch a kid put their heart into something, just doing something. Cause they just, they're not even thinking about it. They're just doing it, you know? And so I think that I will spend the rest of my life trying to figure out what is that natural flow where I'm not thinking about how I look. Or I'm not thinking about you know, sort of, um, triangulating between all these different things. I'm just trying to like do the thing that's fun and, and trying to match that up with something that's useful to people and, you know, and helpful to people. But, um, but it's actually really hard to strip away the, all the stuff that gets built up. Um, and, and it's, and it's, it sucks because we spend so much of our lives at work and yet, um, we often just let work get away with, uh, going by in a blur with being stressful and, and busy with caring about things that we don't really truly care about. And, you know, in a really simple way with not being fun. And there's no reason why we shouldn't try to have fun with, with what we're doing at, at work too. Just like kids want to have fun because fun is fun. Like it's kids kid. just want to have fun, <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 So I don't know. That's, I mean, I know that's a bit, that's a bit random and I don't know if useful, but that's, that's kind of how I think. What I, what I love doing myself with my own seven-year-old is I like investing in what he wants to do. So I actually yeah. I invoke servant leadership with that and say like, okay, um, Alden, you want to do a lemonade stand this summer? Like what, what can I do? Usually he'll have me want to do everything. He just basically wants to stand out in front with lemonade and get all the money and that's yeah. fine. <laughs> it's, uh, it's one of those things where I become I become part of what he uh, wants to do as long as I feel it's constructive within the confines of being a parent. Um, but I try to nurture that notion that things can be fun and things can be not so fun, um, but you kind of have to kind of find some balance in there. So I guess it's different with every parent, but. Yeah. Um, and it's also, it's not as though life can be fun all the time. That's not yeah. realistic to expect, but I do think that we often like, in the workplace we don't let ourselves play or have fun yeah. or just like enjoy oh this is you know this is, this can kind of be enjoyable and um it's really hard to have long-term career goals i mean everything changes so fast so we're just obviously going with the flow too yeah and mm -hmm. one thing that i think uh i enjoyed just without even thinking about it about design sprints and the kinds of of um projects that were under intense deadlines that inspired me to do design sprints. So there's some things that happened before that I could look at and say, God, that was really fun. And we did great stuff. Like, why can't we do that more? Um, what would say that it sort of like rang the same chime for me as uh, when I played basketball and had, you know, a basketball team and we were working together in the game, you know, and like, it felt like we were a, we're a unit and like this, this feeling of like fun and joy, but hard work and all that stuff rolled into one that, can happen in the workplace, but just by default in most companies, it's not gonna, um, you know, you have to you have to break the rules a bit to make it happen, change the rules. Yeah, the company kind of has their own agenda and it's really, yeah. it's, it's, it, it's, it has a purpose and it's really to generate revenue or to, to market share or something. And the fun you have to find is has to be kind of, you know, you kind of have to generate that from the yeah. of what you think you can do. Yeah, company, whether intentionally, like not intentionally, it just the way companies are set up, the idea of making profit from an organization of humans is going to try to squeeze you to uh, do the most stuff and pay you the least to, to do that stuff. I, I, I will, I have to interject, but I will say I just had a thought back when in my days in AT&T a long time ago, there was a group of people that were all developers and designers and we got together with water guns and now they can't do anything about it because that building's closed. But we lose the the <laughs> and we played what is now, you know, Counter-Strike the game, but we basically played that in real life with 10 people 
we basically ordered pizza and we used an entire first and second floor to have like this kind of cops and robbers thing. And that was our fun and our outlet uh, that we did that was outside the purviews of what our, our uh, <laughs> agenda was. But it was one of those memories where at the end when you're all eating pizza and one person is totally wet because they suck at the game, it's one of the things you could razz on the entire time. So I guess that's my contribution to <laughs> keeping, keeping things light and having fun. Um, uh, we did have a question come in from Sandy Lamb. Uh, she is somebody I know well, but she's the product and uh, she's a product designer. She would want me to tell. She's also a design sprinter. She was the most valuable practitioner in the April Global Virtual Design Sprint, and she's helping me with a lot of the the templates that we're using. Her question was: If you can only share one facilitating tip or trick for design sprints, the one that comes to mind, what would it be? If there was only one, then my tip would be to, um, this sounds really self-serving, but to follow the checklist. Because if you, if you sort of boiled it down to just one thing and you were like, hey, everybody, my job here is to get us through this checklist. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, the, the, the checklist is, is going to be our guide. We're going to go through that schedule. Yeah. I'm just going to take you through the checklist. Trust the process. Then trust the process. Um, if it was, if I just could only tell somebody one thing, it's even if I'm doing uh, facilitating a design sprint, even though I wrote the checklist, I'm going to say that, Hey, I got to get us through the checklist. I'm sorry. We have to move on. It's because of the, we got to get through these steps in order to get done. Um, yeah, God, it's the schedule. I'm blaming the schedule and the checklist instead of it being on me. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it's, and it's, I find that very effective and I find it very freeing for me from all the things that plague my, my all the self doubt that I have during a uh, sprint, knowing that like, well, the, the checklist has worked before it will probably work again. And just, I'm just going to keep going on the checklist. So yeah. that's, that would be my one thing, even though it's sort of, my one is don't try to be the smartest in the room. Oh, you, this good. sprint yeah. is not about you. You are not. You're not. You're not a rock I'm star. I'm not until yeah. my head falls off. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> don't. You are here to empower the team to to yeah. guide them through the process, and yeah, you shouldn't try to find the best idea or whatever. Yeah, yeah. That, that is a sure. That that that's a fast lane to migraines. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> But uh, I, I'm really guilty of that, you know, like on day two, I'm trying to find a good idea to sketch Me it too. every and, time, yeah. every time my yeah. idea is not the best. And yeah. I never, every time, <laughs> every time I think like this time, I'm smarter than everyone. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> it never is. That's such a good one. What about you, Robert? What if you had one, only one thing? Only one facilitation tip? Yeah. Um, just over prepare. Uh, it, it never hurts to do a little bit more in terms of thinking uh, especially if you're the only facilitator. I, I always recommend somebody co-facilitating, having a partner in crime with you. Yeah. Uh, but pre over-preparing is the best thing you can do because especially for people that have made less than 10 design sprints under your belt and there may be maybe even somebody who's starting out fresh, uh, you're, you, you, there's a good chance you're going to have brain lock at some point and you'll fall back on those things like a checklist, on the, on the plan that you have, on your friend when you're staring at them and you don't know what happens when somebody starts going through a tirade about the, the process. Yeah. If you don't have that experience, um, falling back on like the plan or over-preparing uh, is, is gonna save you a, a lot of heartache. And maybe a side note to that, a little, a little dentum, is to give yourself a break. This kind of stuff, especially if you're doing at it for the first time, is incredibly taxing. It's really complex. Nobody, you never have to know about it the first time around. No one that I know of who has ever done design sprint the first time has ever came across and said, that was simple, no problem. <laughs> never like that. Uh, cool. So yeah, two things would be over-prepare and take it easy on yourself because the expectations that the people are coming to you for the session are there, but they're not without understanding that you're in a position to try to lead. So um, as long as you have those two things in your back pocket, I think you'll be in good shape. Awesome. Um, so Steph, there's always one question for you here, and this is coming from, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna really butcher this name. I'm gonna give it a shot. It's Quentin Bordeaux. He's the director of innovation at, in Bordeaux, France. And his question was probably uh, related to the sprint corner in a way. He says, how do you guarantee that the delivery of the MVP defined during the three-day sprint will be done at the end of three agile sprints and no more and no less? Yeah, um, so I think he's mentioning uh, this thing that I have here, it's the design sprint quarter. Yeah, why don't you why don't you fold that open and kind of show everyone? Yeah, yeah. Well. 
which is basically it's a timeline that we oh, sorry yeah, it's, it's too... <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so so it's it's a timeline that we have created to basically sure. cool. yeah thank you jake um uh, actually jake was helping a lot in creating this i did um, not help a lot you did it you, you, you give away too much credit for this yeah. like robert said this is hard put together you it did it it yeah. was quite an iterative process with a lot of very smart people who actually saw it and helped us. But the idea is to go from an initial design sprint, which is here, to actually deliver right, right, it. You have to hold it. I'll hold yeah. it up at your point. Yeah. yeah, so it's to go from an initial design sprint, which is here, and then what's what's happening after the sprint. You know, it's always the question that comes, how to execute the vision, how to how to get something out there. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's kind of a roadmap, it's a plan from the design sprint to an actual product that is put uh, to the, um, yeah, into the world and what we call an MVP, basically minimum uh, viable product. And yeah, the, the key basically is to be able to build something and release something in three months. That's the rule of the game. So the way we can guarantee it is we have a first design sprint and we have an iter iteration sprint uh, like two weeks after. And it's crucial to bring the developers who will create the product, build it during this design sprint. So we need basically to scope. It's like we know we have three agile sprints of two weeks. It's basically what can we build in three sprints. And if you take with you, with the team, some uh, you know seasoned developers, they're going to tell you this we can do in three weeks, uh, sorry, in three sprints, this we can do. And it's just about being very honest about what you can do or what you can't. And if it's too broad, if it's too big, yeah, just trim it down to something that you can actually put uh, yeah, put into the world in, uh, in three sprints. So that's the whole thing. We, you can go actually on design-sprint.com uh, slash quarter, and you can download this for free. And yeah, you can are, search for design sprint quarter. Yeah, yeah you can just search yeah on yeah. Google about design sprint quarter, and you can get the PDF. Uh, and yeah, there is a whole article, very long on Medium that yeah. we have posted explaining the whole process. This question mm -hmm. is really good about like how do you yeah. how do you know that you can get something done by this amount of time. And I think that the answer is, one way to answer that question is that it is a matter of conviction and leadership <laughs> yeah. because you certainly can't, you know, Parkinson's law is like, yeah. you know, the task is gonna take up the amount of time given to it. Um, and there's certainly, you could do more if you spent longer. And I know there's gonna be a lot of organizations that uh, we'll all work with who will say, we can't do this, we can't possibly get you know, uh, this thing done in this amount of time. But to, like, if you imagine a leader who says, we are doing the design sprint quarter, we're gonna try it this quarter and we will have an MVP by the end of the quarter. And your job, everybody, is to scope, build and deliver the yeah. thing that will be interesting to us by the end of the quarter. If it's not something that we're releasing to the public but we're testing internally, well, maybe that's our definition of minimum viable product. If it's something that we're releasing to the public but it's a, a smaller piece of what we're gonna do eventually, that's gonna be our minimum viable product. The definition of viable product, like you guys can figure out what that is, but there will be something at the end of this quarter. And if it's you imagine a, a yeah. leader who's like tough enough and like inspiring enough to say that, yeah. the team yeah. can do it. Uh, the, I think a, a good example to give people who question this is um, Basecamp. And Basecamp yeah. does everything in six week. Uh, they do they do six week cycles. So everything for them is six weeks. They don't take on any work that's going to be more than six weeks. They're always done with that thing and then moving on to the next thing in six weeks. And so over time, they figured out how much can we get done in six weeks? How do we break things down into six week pieces? That's a very successful company yeah. who's, who's doing this half the, you know, twice as fast. This is totally, it is doable, but it does require that if you want to know like who you need to convince, it's the leader. Exactly. The leaders yeah. has to, if the leader asks for it, it can't happen. Yeah. For real, it doesn't matter if you are publishing or releasing your product or your MVP two days in advance or two days late or even one week after. It's not really about that. It's just at least my experience in Europe or in Switzerland, people want to put a product in the wild that is perfect. And perfection, it takes years, basically. So already if you have a if you can put something in the world in three months, uh, yeah, whatever it is, it's already a win, I would say. And that's that's crucial. I mean, to execute on the design sprint, you need to be able to put something visible. The sprint, you just show it to five people and with a quarter, you can show it to the world, basically, your MVP. Yeah. One, one idea for you, Steph, and this is just uh, while you were talking about the quarter, 
you know, the other sprint stories, if someday that you started to see some case studies around the sprint quarter starting to manifest, yeah, like, exactly. like companies kind of starting to adopt this, you can basically have a domain of sprintquarters.com. And then you have like literally case studies of these extended six week or what, however long yeah. engagements using the model and how the model is adopted versus the, the reality on the ground and how that eventually comes around. Yeah, this is really exciting because now we have more and more traction on this, more and more people willing to test, at least in their companies. Uh, I discussed with uh, Lee Duncan from IBM. He said, oh yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hang one uh, you know, on the wall at IBM. So that's really cool. And more and more pe people are, are interested with that. And yeah, let's see where it goes basically, yeah. Cool. Um, we'll do one more. This is from Robin Van Zessen. Uh, he's a user experience designer and design thinker from the Breda area in Netherlands. And his question was in healthcare. Uh, he asks, healthcare innovation is something that goes very slow. Mm. We always talk about it's not a sprint, but a marathon. How do you convince more conservative organizations to invest in processes like design sprints? I think that because that's true, because healthcare is so complicated and because it takes so long to actually deliver a solution, is exactly why you should do a design sprint. It's all the more yeah. reason to be sure before you start off on doing something. It's millions. Um, it's, yeah, it's going to cost millions, and it's going to cost a lot of time. The stakes, just generally, the stakes are higher, and the higher the stakes, the the more worthwhile it is to do a design sprint. And um, we were talking earlier about you know things that I would change uh, about the the book, and I, one of the stories that I'd love to follow up on is Flatiron Health, which is the story for the map. Um, and they, uh, that it took them forever to build that thing that they were testing with their sprint. Um, so in the, in the story they're they're starting off on this project that ends up taking them, um, two or three years to, to build. Uh, but you know, they're, and they're still working on it, but it's, it's actually starting to work and, and, you know, it's saving people's lives now. And the company was, um, acquired by uh, Roche for like a billion dollars or something like it's yeah. a good outcome in a lot of different ways but it was it's a really long slow story yeah. and that's the way it is with healthcare I mean I get I get that that's true but that is why you should be careful yeah. before you start um, actually speaking about Roche they are from Switzerland and I know they run design sprints internally uh, design thinking as well uh, we we did that retreat in Switzerland together and there were some people from Roche uh, yeah. so I think it's always powerful to show that some competitors of the company yeah, yeah. Are, you know like uh, are actually running sprints and yeah it just pushes them to try at least the problem of complex projects being paralyzing to start which is something we talked about at the very beginning like things that that make you get stuck when you're trying to be creative and mm. healthcare might not sound like a creative but of course if you're trying to solve something you're gonna have to be creative it's all the more paralyzing to start doing a big healthcare project because it's so complex. And again, it's like the design sprint is nice because it's a forcing function that says, we can't solve all of it at once. We're just gonna pick this one narrow slice and then start to learn about what would happen if we yeah. fix that. And uh, and yeah, I think, I, I do think it works. It works really, really well. You just have to make that case that the, about the, the potential pain that'll happen if, um, if you get it wrong. And you know, you find yourself two years, three years, six years down the road and you, you weren't on the right track, you know, or you didn't pursue the right angle. Yeah. And a lot of things in this, this may speak to enterprises in general. They are slow by default. I mean, they, yeah. they're established, they're entrenched. They've, they've, they've made it. They have a certain, uh, they have a certain market share and they, they, the conservative view is that you want to hold on to that market share and iterate where it makes sense, but be very tactical and strategic about your spend. So the design sprint, when it, when it first came out, I can tell you from experience, was highly disruptive. Even with design thinking, it just, it's, it just set a different tone around execution, speed, efficiency, things that people were like, whoa, 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 hang on, let's talk this out. And people want to really absorb it. But fast forward three years from now, and then you have places like Home Depot, you have Roche as another example. You have internal companies that have absorbed and used the methodology in a way that makes sense to them. So maybe my, my, if I can also solicit an answer is, is that, yes, they are slow for a reason. Same with McKesson. McKesson is a, a company that my wife works for. And I know that they've been kind of dabbling in design thinking too. And they see it as like, they're, they're one of the, the, the companies that is very tactful and very careful, but the conversation is happening. 
And along with any kind of design thinking, design sprint conversation is what makes sense for them. And they'll experiment, try different things, but really it's a long game. But if you're in for the long game um, and you can ride that wave and be, be you know, continually being exposed to design sprints and what it's all about, um, it'll benefit you from the perspective of a, a professional career and getting that exposure, but also being the person that is seen as either the authority or a voice related to how design sprints can function well in that sort of environment. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's close it out by kind of going over some things that both of you are going to be involved with in coming months. Uh, Jake, you are very much with workshops and, and kind of being involved with those. You have two with uh, Douglas Ferguson and Voltage Control. You've got one coming up on October 15th in Vancouver, Canada. Yeah. You have another one in Seattle, yeah. Washington. <clears throat> Where's that? <clears throat> Excuse me, that Seattle's chugged me up. I used to live there. <laughs> That's so. where we are right now. It's so yeah. where I live now. I just moved back. So any weather uh, to Seattle. Up. Yes, it probably won't be uh, at the workshop. But yeah, I would love to see people there. Um, I have one in Barcelona, but it is sold out. Um, really? There's a, yeah. Well, yeah. We've, we've That's on until November 3rd and it's sold yeah. out already. Jake yeah. and Jeff could have. Oh my God. Uh, we'll probably do, uh, you know, probably do another one together because, um, uh, it seems like people are interested in that, but you know what um, you ought to do also... is you ought to you ought to start a petition of some type. So it's like if you want if you want Jake Knapp to come do a workshop in your yeah. city, you should literally just like have have this form of like all right, just sign up and then see how many people are interested and see if it's like a, a Kickstarter. That's a good idea. Exactly, or something, yeah. something related, so you can see like there's a hot bend in Israel or UAE. Yeah, so no. like, bring him here. You know, you yeah, can. That's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um... Yeah, jakenap.com. There's links to the workshops there. There's one in Charlotte, North Carolina in March. Um, and there will be more. And you can sign up for my newsletter. Uh, I also always announce them mm -hmm. to the newsletter. We're going to do yeah. something together in August next year oh, yeah, in right. Switzerland. Yeah. So mark <laughs> calendars. Yeah, you can mark <laughs> on the 20th of August. You really need to. You really need to create like a calendar in in like a Google Calendar or something where you can just add it. You know, you can add holidays. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You can just basically make it like Jake's workshops and just basically <laughs> so that whenever you update it, it automatically goes on the calendar. It's like, oh, now I got to travel to Switzerland. Yeah, oh, God, God. this is going to be the worst. Yeah. Yeah. Steph, what do you got coming up? What, what should people know about? Um, I don't know. A couple of, uh, we're going to have uh, a webinar about uh, the Design Spin Quarter with Doug Ferguson. It's going to be very soon. Um, and yeah, uh, otherwise, a couple of uh, workshops in, uh, in Sweden. We are thinking to run more and more uh, workshops and meetups. We just got chosen to have the Design Spin chapter in, uh, in Switzerland. So it's going to be in Lausanne. And so running more events uh, with Google. Uh, hopefully and doing more and more stuff like that uh, and we have that uh, that big project for something big with jake it's going to be august next year and with other speakers you will see and yeah and then let's see uh, where it's going yeah very cool and for those of you who registered to see this on zoom i will be sending out all the links that these gentlemen are talking about uh, i'll update the youtube notes as well from the live broadcast so that people have access to those uh, and i think with this is a wrap so uh, jake and steph Thank you so, so much for doing this session. I, I really enjoyed it. Hopefully it was a, it, you felt, felt the same. Um, if you have anything, any parting uh, words, then feel free to say so. <laughs> it was super fun. Thanks yeah. so much for thank having you so us. Thank up, Robert. Yeah. And thank you, everybody, for dialing in and asking yeah. questions. And uh, rock on. We'll see you Definitely. later. Definitely. All right. So you all have a good weekend. And uh, we'll talk to you soon, probably, all right? Yeah. 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 Definitely. Yeah. All right. Definitely. Bye, See everybody. Ya. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Talk to you later. <laughs> We're closing down. <laughs>